Hi and welcome back to the Open Tech Lab. So this is an update on the status of the linking HDMI capture device project that I've been covering in the past few videos. And if you haven't seen the beginning of this series, go back and check out the first few parts. Basically, this is all about trying to reverse engineer this device. Its original purpose was to send HDMI signals long distances across a network. And I'm interested in trying to mess around with this device to figure out as much about it as I can, and perhaps even to be able to reprogram it to make it do new and interesting things. And there have been some very interesting discoveries in the last few weeks. Now, the thing I enjoy the most about running this channel is all the conversations I have with all of you in the audience. And I don't have too many subs on this channel, it's not too big. And so I can read every comment I receive from all of you. And I got a lot of interesting clues and suggestions off the back of the last few videos. So pretty soon after the release of the last video, a few folks came together and one guy who goes by FFY00, he set up an IRC channel. It's hash LKV373A on Freenode. So it's very good that all the old hands who've been tinkering with this device, they now have a place where they can come together and talk to each other. And if you're interested in getting involved with the Lenkeng device or any other devices based on similar chips, I think that will be a very good place to start. Now you might remember in the previous video there are two chips on the board, MU1 and U2, and both of them have had their markings burned off. MU1 seems to be in charge, but we don't have much information about it or even what chip it is. U2 is an IT9919 made by ITE. We don't have much information about it either beyond a very simple data sheet that was leaked onto the internet. But nonetheless, I was able to gain very basic code execution on this chip by modifying the upgrader software that's built into the upgrade package. And based off the work of uh, some interesting blog posts by Velociraptor, uh, he wrote some interesting uh, articles reverse engineering the architecture. Based off his work, I was able to make some interesting progress, uh, further reverse engineering the instruction set and writing some very simple programs. So after the release of the last video, another guy came forward and gave the project a massive boost. He came to me in my Twitter DMs and he wanted to just be known by the label MW, which is fine. Uh, anyway, he came with this comment. Hi there, just in case uh, someone else hasn't pointed it out to you already, I believe the ISA you have re been reverse engineering here is open risk. The ALU on hex 38 is the dead giveaway, I think. And he was quite correct, this is indeed an OpenRISC 1000 processor, otherwise known as OR1K. Now, if you haven't encountered OpenRISC before, it's probably most famous for being the flagship of the OpenCores community. OpenCores is a massive open source repository of modules that you can include in your FPGA design, uh, or even do what ITE did and bake it into your silicon chip. And they've got all kinds of modules for all sorts of purposes down here. And they even have almost 200 processor designs, all kinds of different processor CPUs to place into your FPGA project. Uh, but probably the most famous of all the different uh, cores, uh, processor cores they have here is OpenRISC. Now, OpenRISC has been around for almost 20 years now. It's MIPS inspired. MIPS has an even longer pedigree than that, goes back a very long time. Lots of different MIPS inspired CPU architectures out there. Now, ITE chose to use the 32 bit variant of this uh, instruction set architecture and the variant that has 32 registers. Uh, 32 32 bit registers to play with. Uh, actually, you only have 31 to play with because the, uh, the, the zeroth register is always hardwired to zero. Uh, but beyond that, there's not much to say about this, uh, this instruction set architecture. It's pretty simple. It's designed for simplicity uh, rather than code density and uh, high performance characteristics like that. And the reason for that is that it was originally inspired for use in uh, FPGAs. Uh, 20 years ago, an FPGA was a very expensive thing, particularly large FPGAs were prohibitively expensive. And so the main priority in the design is the simplicity of the implementation.
presentation. You don't want to use up all your precious FPGA resources to make some super complicated uh, CPU core, soft core inside your design. And that's the uh, focus of the open risk architecture. Now you might ask why ICE chose to use this architecture. And I think the reason is quite simple because it's free and they don't have to pay any royalties to ARM or anyone else to use this architecture. They could put it in their design and not have to pay anything more for it. And although this architecture is not super common, this is the first open risk uh, CPU I've ever played around with, it is still common enough that there is quite good tooling for open risk, including really good support in GCC and the various other tools that are available in the open source tool chains. So I was completely blown away by that contribution from MW, an amazing breakthrough. But then he completely outdid himself by sending me more information. He says, I think I might have found an SDK as well. It was a good mystery that took me all of five hours to get to the bottom of. Someone appears to have checked in the entire SDK to an open Git site. Once I found out the name of the SDK, it was easy through some open SDK training videos on the ITC website. And what he sent to me was the IP address of this random Git server he found running somewhere in Taiwan. So this development caused great excitement in the IRC channel as we began to dig into what was available on this server. However, by the time I started making this video, whoever runs the server seems to have got wise to their unauthorized access going on and they seem to have locked it down. So I can't show you what's inside here anymore. And it's a bit unfortunate that they did that. However, they didn't manage to lock it down before I'd taken a full copy of the Git repositories that were on offer here. So let's have a little look at what we've captured here. So this is the ITE Caster 3 SDK. Now, I don't know exactly what this SDK is for. Uh, I don't even know that it targets any of the chips that we have on the LKV device. It just seems to be related somewhat. There seems to be a lot of similarities with various things that seem to be present in the SDK and our device. And there's various bits of information that we can glean from this. Now, looking through here, you can see there's a folder called OpenRTOS. So, a uh, real-time operating system, open source, there's an SDK folder, there's a CMake file, presumably to build everything. There's a doc folder that has some uh, Doxygen and it has a load of PDF files for the SDK. And uh, looking through the PDFs, uh, most of them are in Chinese, so I can't read them without feeding them through Google Translate. But looking at the diagrams, it appears to be that this SDK is for uh, a chipset for some kind of video intercom. So you would have this attached to the outside of a block of flats or something. Uh, people would come up and show their face to a camera and then that would feed through to the different apartments. And uh, this seems to be what this toolkit is all about. But it seems to be using, as I say, many of these same technological pieces as we are interesting. So there's one or two interesting things that we can learn from this. Now I'd say the most exciting discovery that I found here was this file here, decompress.c, and you can see the magic here is for the SMAS, and this is the holy grail, the decompressing code for the SMAS decompression scheme that I've been trying to decode for all these months through brute forcing it, and if we scroll down here, the code is right here, here we go. Now. You might be asking yourself, is this a bit legally shady, showing off this code, showing off all this proprietary stuff uh, that we acquired through slightly shady means? And uh, one thing I will counter is to say right here in this comment, it says thinned out version of the UCL 2E decompression source code, originally Marcus FXJ Obenhuma under the GPL license. So this code is uh, acquired from the GNU GPL and they really should have released it and made it available to everyone who really uh, received the LKV device in the first place. Anyway, Looking through this code, it's relatively simple. There's not much to it, and we can make use of it to start decompressing things that are encoded in SMAS. So the code for my version of the tool is up on GitHub if you want to make use of it, but we can have a little play with it right here. So I've got a folder and it's got a symbolic link to a backup of the flash chip from MU1 that I took a very long time ago. And we have SMAS deck, which is now in my path. And you can see with no arguments, it prints the usage. Usage is very simple. So we can just run SMAS deck, uh, put in the path to the file, uh, give it a file name to unpack into and run and it's 
very, very quick to run. If we look at the files we've got, uh, we have a 320 kilobyte unpack file. So the first thing one might do is run it through binwalk uh, to see if it can pick out much information there. If we run binwalk, uh, well, it found a CLC table. Maybe that will be useful for figuring out some checksum somewhere along the line, who knows? Uh, and the other thing that's worth doing, of course, is strings. Uh, if we run strings unpack bin and pipe it into less so we can scroll through the list, uh, you can see here we have a few things. And then you can see we have these uh, files from someone's D drive on their computer, D git projects, ITE Castor 3, which of course relates to the SDK that we borrowed from that Git repository. So of course this wasn't created using the uh, SDK for a doorbell, but obviously there's some uh, relationship with the code going on here. And then if we scroll down through less and what we've got here, uh, one or two things, a lot of these paths, all the different strings that it prints out, uh, names of chips, various things, lots of interesting things here. So clearly the decoder is working correctly because if it wasn't, we would just have complete corrupted garbage coming out at this stage. And we don't, we seem to have something useful uh, that we can make sense out of. Very good. Now from the information we have available, it is fully confirmed now that U2 is an IT9919, just the way we suspected. Now, based on a few other pieces of information that came to light, there were a few potential candidates for the identity of MU1. So we spent some time trying to match MU1 up with the data sheets we had available. For example, here you can see I'm tracing out the tracks to the Ethernet FI in this high resolution photo of the board. But unfortunately, all the candidates got ruled out. Uh, well, except just one uh, for the IT9070. But unfortunately, that's the one chip that we don't have access to any data sheets for. So if you happen to have access to any documents for the IT9070, it would be interesting to know if this one fits the bill. Now, with all the things that have been discovered, there are many ways that I could take this forward at this point. But given that we know that the processor core inside U2 is OpenRISC OR1K, I was really curious to see if we could use GCC to make it possible to compile C code and get it running on this processor. Because of course, previously I've been using my homebrew assembler and it's been a rather unpleasant user experience. So to be able to compile C code for this C processor would be rather useful. And it's a good opportunity to show off a nice uh, advanced example of GCC usage if you haven't seen this used before. So let's jump in and see what we can do. So before getting into too much detail about this, let's have a look at what the demo actually consists of. So here I have a project folder and inside we have a few files. We have a symbolic link to the Lenkeng upgrader software for U2 and we're gonna patch in some C code into this. Then we have a C file here and this contains our code. We have a make file that builds everything. We have a Python script, some assembly code and a linker script and I'll go into these in a minute. So now let's have a look at the C code inside the C file and if you go to the top you can see there's a few bits and pieces hanging around up here I'll go into those in a moment but if we go down to the bottom uh, we've got our main function here and you can see it just contains a single call to printf which prints out the text open tech lab in big letters and it also says hello from printf and then uses a format string to print out the number 12345 and this is here just to demonstrate that we can properly use printf with all its various features which shows that we've attained a certain level of sophistication in terms of what we're able to run on the device. So let's go ahead and try building this thing. So I'm gonna run make and it does a few things and it makes a few files. And the one that really matters here is this mod FW bin file. This is the Lenkeng upgrader software with our C code patched into it. And this is what we're gonna load onto the device and run. Now, before we run it, I need to set up this little uh, monitor TTY thing. Now this is just a handy Python script that uh, starts up the serial shell and it automatically finds the right serial device uh, just as a developer shortcut. And what we'll get here is the spew of every piece of output that's coming out of the serial port of the Lenkeng device. So with that watching in the background, let's go ahead and load in the firmware. So over here in Firefox, I've got the, uh, the control panel. Uh, it doesn't seem like this is meant for users. This is all containing 
secret settings. Uh, and what's interesting is that we have these two upgrader buttons. You might remember we have one that upgrades the main firmware for the whole system uh, with these package files and one that just upgrades U2, which is a very odd design. This is obviously not designed for users, but for developers. Uh, but for our purposes, it's extremely handy because it means we can just load up uh, our patch firmware here without having to bother with anything else. So if I go ahead and click upgrade here, it will load in the firmware into the device and then we'll just wait monitoring the TTY, monitoring the serial port. And there we go. And you can see our C code has printed out the Open Tech Lab logo. It's printed hello world and the number correctly. And then what's really interesting is that the code is working well enough so that it can then hand back control to the main flasher software. And then the flasher program is carrying on working like normal upgrading the flash. So this shows that not only is our C code working correctly up here, but also it's a good enough citizen on the system that it can hand back control uh, to the main software, the main flasher software, without bombing out and breaking everything and crashing. So this shows this is working really, really well. Okay, so with the demo out the way, let's have a look at how it actually works. So in this demo, I chose to compile GCC from source code. And that's one of the most amazing things about having open source compilers is that you can uh, download them and build them for any type of architecture that they support anything you need. So it is perfectly possible to build it from source manually on the command line, but it comes it becomes a bit fiddly and it's easy to make mistakes. So I often automate it with a little script just to make sure I can do things correctly and repeatably, uh, which is very important especially as it's a slightly lengthy process. So here you can see I have my script that will build the compiler. And what it does is first it defines this variable prefix. Uh, this variable defines where our tools will be installed. So I could install it into the system uh, USR local directory, which would be uh, the default. But in this case, uh, I just want to install it in a little subdirectory here just to keep it self-contained. Then the next step is to uh, download the source code. Um, then after that, after we have the source code for binutils, newlib, and GCC, we have to go and build these things. So G uh, binutils contains uh, the assembler and object dump and object copy and various tools that are used by the linker and so on just to copy compile code around. And uh, this uh, is relatively simple and straightforward to build. So we just uh, create a build directory and inside it use configure, the con auto tools configure script uh, to go and uh, generate the make files and then use make uh, to make that and make install. Now, after this point, things become a little bit more hairy um, because we have to build GCC, uh, but GCC itself requires uh, a, C a C standard library. A C standard library is a library like glibc, for example, or uh, muscle or newlib, uh, which is what we're using here. C standard libraries contain implementations of uh, printf and uh, fopen and rand and the various standard uh, C standard um, uh, functions that you would expect to be able to call inside a C program. But Unfortunately, because the C compiler is heavily dependent on this library, it's not possible to build the fully fledged C compiler until after we've built our uh, C library. So there is this uh, cyclic dependency between the C library and the compiler, which we need to break. So the solution to that is that we have to build GCC twice. And the first time around, we build a very, very minimal uh, version of the GCC compiler that is missing the features that will be enabled by having uh, a C standard library. That's pretty much everything. So in this case, we do a similar configure job as we did with uh, bin utils. Uh, but this time, we have to say without headers and uh, disable various things like uh, NLS and so on, uh, just to make a very minimal compiler that is just good enough to be able to compile the C standard library itself. And I suppose uh, we also have to pass in a bit more information uh, with newlib here. Uh, that specifies that we're going to be using newlib, so it's got a special option for that because we're using newlib C library. Enable multilib, that controls the installation directory structure. And I think if you're doing a modern compiler build, it's probably preferable. It helps various things to coexist. For example, if you want multiple architectures within your prefix, and it has a nice ordered structure to things, which I always prefer to use rather than 
not. So, okay, so we're gonna build our bootstrapping GCC and that will take a few minutes and then install that in the prefix. So now they, there is this um, uh, bootstrapping GCC version in the prefix. We can then use that uh, to go ahead and build new lib and that will build in much same way. Again, we do configure, enable multi-lib, disable new lib supplied syscalls. Now this is one that's interesting uh, because of course we're targeting an embedded device that doesn't have a kernel of any sort that we have access to. So for example, if you use the standard fopen uh, function inside a C standard library, that will open a file. Uh, but what do you do on a system that doesn't have any files or any kernel uh, for you to call into to open the file, uh, open the files with? Well, uh, in this case, we can say, well, this, this system just doesn't have that. It doesn't have any uh, kernel for you to talk to. So just disable the syscalls. And so what uh, will happen here is that uh, for those functions, new lib will be compiled with a dangling reference. And in fact, there's dangling references for all sorts of things, which we'll go into in a minute. Okay, so then we compile new lib and install it, and then head down to the final step, which is to build the actual fully fledged GCC. Uh, this time we can enable uh, both C and C++. So we can build a full on set of compilers for uh, both languages, and we could add more languages here. We could add Fortran and uh, I don't know, Rust or whatever else it supports, I don't know. Uh, C and C++ are the ones I normally use, uh, but depending on your project, perhaps you'd like to enable some more languages. Anyway, uh, this uh, will all take a little while to uh, uh, run when we run it, but at the end of it, hopefully it should give us everything we need. And of course, I will uh, just emphasize of course you can do this all just by typing these commands in on the command line, uh, but it really is a little bit tricky to maintain the repeatability and it becomes a bit fiddly and painful. Uh, so a script like this makes it a bit more manageable. And as with everything I'm showing here, the source code is available in the show notes. So you might think this is a bit sappy and stupid, but I do absolutely love doing this. There's something so amazing to me about being able to build any compiler I want from source for practically any architecture with all the options under my own control. It's really amazing. It's just so cool to be able to do this. And it's quite a contrast to what's available in the world of proprietary software. Okay, so that took about 20 minutes to complete on my i7 machine. So let's have a look at what's inside the prefix directory. And if you see here, we've got the various folders that go to make up the installation. And if we have a look in the bin directory, we'll see all the executables. And you can see here, we've got a few things. We've got uh, an assembler. We have a C++ compiler here, G++, and we have GCC. So this is the compiler for C and for C++ and all the supporting tools that are necessary to make it work. Right, so now to understand how this project actually works, let's have a look at where everything starts in this. So this is the entry point code that I've written, and it's written in assembly language. Now the thing to understand here is that uh, I'm doing the exact same trick as I did in my previous videos, where I'm taking the U2 flash upgrader software and inserting into it some patched in code. And the benefit of doing this is that I don't understand very much about the IT9910 and how to program it. And one of the key things you always have to do when you're using a microcontroller is a whole load of setup code, uh, things that you have to set, various clocks and dividers, uh, set up UARTs and all kinds of peripherals before you can really get the chip to do anything. And at this time, I don't really have much understanding about how to do any of that stuff. So for the time being, the best way is just to take a piece of software that we know that works and add some functionality into it, uh, just modify it a little bit to make it do what we want. And in my previous videos, I was taking the normal software and I found a place in it where it prints out some text that says SDK version. In fact, that's the first printf that gets called when the flash upgrader software kicks in. And instead of using my own homebrew Python scripts to do this, I can now do it using the proper GNU tools, bin utils, the proper GNU assembler. So what you're seeing here is the location where, which would normally invoke printf. And instead of doing that, we're going to override those instructions with this assembly code here. Uh, and this just jumps straight into the C code, uh, the main function. This is actually, it's not a jump, it's a call. So when main returns, 
uh, things will carry on as normal. Now, uh, we only need this just one single instruction, but because of the way OpenRisk works, we actually have to put a NOP after it because these two instructions actually get executed in reverse order uh, when you're jumping in uh, OpenRisk. I won't go into why. It's a, a weird quirk of the way MIPS uh, architectures work in general. So up here we have some labeling that specifies uh, what section this code is going to get put into and that defines the address that it's going to get located in and the addresses are defined in the linker script. So let's, uh, let's have a look at the linker script here and uh, this is what defines the layout uh, of our code that the uh, linker is going to put together when it's built everything. So you can see down here we have uh, the location address of where we want our little bit of patch assembly code to get inserted in. Uh, 76F0 is that printf. So what's going to happen is we're going to run this little bit of assembly code and it's going to jump over here to this code. Our main function will be located inside the text section here. So in the Flash Upgrader software there's a large area inside the file, inside the binary that is just filled with zeros and is unused. So we are locating our patch and most of the bulk of what the code we're inserting in within this little piece of space in the binary. So what we have here is uh, stuff that uh, starts at this 200 location. The first thing we have is the read-only section containing the binary executable code and the uh, constant data, things like strings and constant variables and so on. Then we have the read-writable section. Data contains uh, things like all the ver uh, global variables and so on. And we also have to define the location of the heap. Uh, and by having this, it means that our code can run malloc, uh, which I've never actually tried using, but it seems to be necessary in order to use printf. So I had to define an area of memory to be able to use that. So to understand how this is all put together, let's have a look at the make file. And you can see it's pretty simple and straightforward. We have rules to assemble the assembly code and rules to compile the C code. Uh, we have a rule here that links them together to make an ELF file. This is what a Linux executable usually consists of. But we can't have an ELF file loaded onto the device. We need to uh, have a binary file. And then I have this Python script here, which is used to superimpose uh, the sections from the ELF file into the normal Flash Upgrader software. Now, I had to use this Python script to do the job. Uh, it's a pretty simple script, uh, nothing too fancy. It uses this ELF file module, and it seemed to be the easiest way to superimpose the two files on top of each other. Now, I'm sure there must be a tool that can do this automatically without needing any Python script, but I couldn't really figure out how to do it. I would have thought object copy could do something like this, but I didn't really figure out how. If anyone knows, leave a comment in the uh, comments section. Maybe you can uh, give me a tip for next time. But anyway, the Python script works well enough, and this is just a simple little hack, so who really cares anyway? So we have the compiled C code, the assembled assembly code. Uh, the flags are worth looking at. So of course, we're specifying the open risk compiler here. Uh, the C flag is quite unusual. Uh, we've got this freestanding option, which is uh, what you need when you're not compiling a normal program that runs on an operating system. It's useful when you're building something like a kernel or I don't know, a microcontroller image or something like that that's completely independent of any operating system, just a self-contained blob. That's the option you specify for that. And in a similar way, we want to have a lot of control over what the linker's doing. And because of that, we have this no std lib option here. And that turns off all the default files that are linked in uh, to your executable so that you can specify which ones you want explicitly to make sure you only get what you want linked into the final product. Product. And this is very important because we're really trying to keep this as lean and mean as possible. So we want a C library, so we get printf and friends. We need libgcc so that we get the uh, low level uh, bits of code that are used uh, uh, to help various things happen from the compiler. We need uh, libm, which uh, provides some mathematics support. And we need libor1k, which is part of libgloss. And I'll go into that one in a little moment. Um, 
And then this, uh, this option here, uh, GC sections, that stands for garbage collect the sections. And this is used to make the linker delete any bits of code and so on that are not actually used anywhere in the program. And this is very important for slimming the final executable down to the absolute minimum. And then this option here just removes the debug information from the final executable, save me having to strip it off later on. So we have all these rules. It builds our mod firmware dot bin, and that's about all there is to it. Now as you can see this is all very simple and we've just about covered everything now apart from one thing uh, which is this little section of random incantations that I've got at the top of the C file. So let's have a closer look at what's going on here. So this is all about trying to figure out how printf is going to do its job. When it prints, what is it going to print into and how is it going to do it? So to illustrate the situation, I've pulled up the source code for the puts function, puts, uh, and the job of this function, you may well be aware, it prints out a string and appends a new line character on the end. And if we scroll down to the bottom of the file, you can see the implementation of it right here at the bottom. And uh, this is a very short file, only 130 lines long. And if we scroll up, you can see this puts r function here is implemented and actually does the, uh, does the business of this function. And the way it works is very, very simple. It just loads up this array uh, of IOVs. And these IOVs are basically pointers to different bits of buffer that will be written out. And so so we have an array containing two IOVs. The first IOV is pointed at the string we provided, and then the second one points at a new line character. And this is then passed into this function, SFV write R, which is the internal function within newlib that actually goes ahead and writes out our buffers. So as you can see in this diagram here, we have our demo software at the top and we have newlib in the middle. And of course we have our SFE write function. And what it does is it calls through to a function called write R. Now this is not implemented inside newlib itself. Uh, the way it works is that you are expected to provide an implementation of this function. Because of course we could print out into pretty much anything we want. We might print into an operating system console terminal down here. Uh, we might be printing into a serial port or a deep bugging buffer or a display of some kind, really anything. And it's up to us to decide what we want to print into. And so well, the way this works is that we must provide an implementation of the right R function somewhere in the program. And without it, this software simply won't build because the linker can't link up the references. So we must provide a, a right R function. And in fact, there are a couple of dozen uh, different dangling references that Newlib has, and we must tie up all of these. Now, this could be a slightly laborious task, uh, but for convenience, Newlib provides a small little family of libraries called libgloss uh, to gloss over the behavior of whatever platform you happen to be on. And they even provide one for OpenRisk. So let's have a look at how that works. So there's a few different source files inside libgloss and I won't go into all of them, but probably the most relevant one is this one called syscalls, reentrant syscalls for open risk 1000. And as you can see this comment down here, it says write is actually the only thing we provide. All others are stubs. And here is their implementation of write R. And as you can see, it's jolly simple. It takes in a pointer to the buffer and the number of bytes, and then it just breaks it down by calling this function OR1K out byte. So it just takes the buffers and writes them out into the out byte function one by one. And then if we scroll down to the bottom here, you can see all the other functions in the system uh, are implemented using stubs. And so it just sets an error saying, basically this is not implemented. So it's really very simple gloss, but it saves me having to have some boilerplate like this in my program, which is very handy. So if we have a look at the implementation of OR1K out byte, you can see that it is phenomenally simple. They wrote it in assembly language and it simply takes the character and passes it in as an argument to the OR1K UART write function, which is to say that every character that's printed out by printf, if you use libgloss, the default implementation will just print it out of the serial port, whatever serial port you happen to have configured with libgloss.
So if you've been following this project, you'll know that I've been taking my serial port spew from this pin on the pin header J4. And this is what I've got my serial port connected to. And this uh, feeds out the output that we get from U2 in our earlier experiments. And so the question is, how exactly does it do that? What, which of the pins on this device is this wired to? And we know from the data sheet and from the headers that the IT9919 has four UARTs in all and we even know their addresses. And so we can write bytes into the transmit buffer register for the UART, uh, each of the UARTs one by one to try and figure out which one it is that's wired through to the pin. And so I set about doing that and I quickly discovered that it appears that none of the UARTs on this device cause any output at all. And so unless I've made a mistake, it appears that this serial port pin is not actually wired to U2 at all. Instead, I think it's wired to MU1. Now the question is, how then is U2 able to actually print anything out? And I think the answer would be that uh, this device probably implements some kind of in-memory ring buffer and uh, MU1 is able to read the contents of the ring buffer because it has access to the memory inside this device through something called the host interface, which is a, an SPI port that this device has. And there are SPI uh, messages that MU1 can send to U2, which allows it to tell U2 to send back any part of the memory that it wants to at any time. And so MU1 simply is polling pulling uh, U2's memory all the time, seeing if there's any bytes that have built up in the buffer. And if it does, it collects them out and then prints them out of its serial port. That's my hunch. Now, of course, I don't know really how any of this stuff is implemented and I don't really care to know because we can already make it work. We just have to hijack this part of the software, the Lenkeng software to do that job. So if we can just find a way to link Newlib up to the Lenkeng software, everything should just work. So I did a bit of investigation about how to make this work. And so at first I took the OR1K outbyte function and made an implementation of it, overriding the one in libgloss. And I implemented it so that every character that was printed would get passed into puts. And uh, puts will of course print this out through the terminal into the ring buffer or whatever it is. But the problem with doing this is that puts inserts new line characters after everything you print. So if you print a single character, there every character will be interspersed with a new line or uh, you know whole buffers will get extra new lines added. So that's really not desirable. So I did a bit more digging around and it turns out that the Lenkeng software is itself written using Newlib just as our demo is up here. So we've got two copies of Newlib in the system. And by doing a bit of digging around with the disassembler, I was able to find the SFV write R function inside the Lenkeng software. And with that function, I was able to just write some code that simply passes every character and then uh, just invokes SFV write R for every single character. Now this could be done more efficiently by rather than uh, having OR1K out bytes, instead make our own implementation of write R and uh, cut out this process of breaking it down into bytes. But you know, this is just a quick little demo, so I could do it better than I have done, uh, but as it, as I have it implemented, it does actually work. So if we look at the code here, what we have is our OR1K outbyte function here. We had to redeclare the IOV structures uh, because these are internal to new libs, so we just need to copy them out for our own version. Uh, I've got a definition of the function pointer for the SFV write R function. And then we simply take the value OXA512C, which is the address, cast it into the function pointer for the SFV write R function, and then invoke it uh, with the right arguments. And there is a bit more magic here and there, the address of something called the reent we have to pass in. This basically contains the, uh, the handle to the stood out buffer and so on. But anyway, this is how all this is working. This is just C code to hijack the implementation of Newlib inside the Lenkeng software. And that's how this demo works. So I hope you found that really interesting. It was a fun little experiment to try out some unusual compiler techniques. It was really fun to play around with and it's unbelievable how much of a rabbit hole this project's been and how many uh, things it's led us into. It's been fantastic. Now I've been playing around with this hardware for quite a while now and I'm beginning to ask myself, well, what's the goal here? What should I try and move on to? And I'd be interested to hear your feedback and what you think about it. I think the main issue here is that the chipset seems to be quite old now and I think even ITE 
might have declared it end of life, although these LKV devices are very cheap and available. But they do seem to be quite limited in their resolution. They only seem to be able to go up to 720p, uh, which is quite a limiting factor if I were actually going to use this for any kind of professional application. So I don't know really uh, what the best way forward with this specific device is. But I'm now really, really interested in the products that Lenkeng offer. And I've discovered that they have a range of other uh, HDMI uh, extended devices for 1080p and 4K. So I have placed a bumper order on AliExpress. I've ordered the 4K devices, the 1080p devices, and I've also ordered the receiver for the uh, LKB373A. So in the next video, we'll do teardowns of all these things. And I just want to thank everyone who's supporting the channel on subscribe star or sending in their donations by PayPal. If that's you or if you're thinking of supporting the channel, I really appreciate it. It's great having a group of people getting behind the channel and helping keep it well supplied with lots of gear to make videos about. Anyway, I'm Joel Holdsworth and this is the Open Tech Lab. I hope you found this video really interesting. Check out the show notes which I'll link down below and they'll contain all the code and lots of background information, anything you might want to dig into and leave your comments down below. I'm really interested to hear what you think. Anyway, I'll see you next time on the Open Tech Lab.